Good morning again. <laughs> so I was just, uh, so today we are going to jump back into our study in the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount specifically. And what we've been doing since uh, probably September is we've been looking at the book of Matthew. Yeah, kids, get out of here. You don't want to hear all this. We're grateful to have uh, servants who teach our kids ages 0 to 10 every Sunday morning so that uh, they might serve our families in helping our families disciple their kids and fulfill that, that uh, desire of God. So th- with that said, back to Matthew. We've been, we started out in, in uh, Matthew at the very end. We talked about God's, the Great Commission and Christ's mission and how he draws us into that. And we saw that Jesus is the king of the universe. And then we looked at during December, we took an Advent series and we looked at the very beginning of Matthew and we saw how Jesus was king of the Jews. And so the idea there is that we would see the, the importance of Matthew, or at least the theme of Matthew is describing the kingdom of God and who is the king. And so that theme that runs throughout Matthew is where we find ourselves as we come into the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is within Matthew. So we, we, we said, let's, let's take a look at this. We're going to take a look at this like a puzzle, and we're going to put all of these puzzle pieces together. And so we have the, the so if I just described all the edges, right? We have the, the edges. We have, he starts out as the king of the Jews. He ends up, it's king of, of the cosmos, if you will. So we've got the edges of our puzzle. And then we come into this area, the Sermon on the Mount, which is very early in the story. And now we're going to kind of start filling out a, a corner, if you will, another piece of that. So we're going to put all these pieces of, of the puzzle together in the Sermon on the Mount. But within that section, within that picture, as we look at the at the box, and we look at the picture, and we go, okay, this is what we got, Sermon of the Mount. Oh, there's some Beatitudes in there. So we'll get all the Beatitude pieces, and we're going to put all those together so that we're going to fill out the Sermon of the Mount that will help us fill out the whole puzzle. That's how we're looking at this. And so what we've been doing then through the, the teaching, God's teaching, and, or, or Jesus' teaching on the Sermon of the Mount through these Beatitudes is taking these Beatitudes puzzle piece by puzzle piece by puzzle piece, seeing how they fit together. And so what we see then is we see that the Sermon of the Mount is the, inaugurational, the inauguration address, I suppose, of the king of, the, of God's kingdom. And then in this Beatitudes part of that Sermon on the Mount, we're seeing that, that, that section that where the king describes the citizens of his kingdom. And so that's where we find ourselves this morning. Before we jump into verse 6, I've asked Joel to read this section of scripture, this, this part of the puzzle. So if you'll stand with us and, and listen as Joel reads through the whole section of the Beatitudes, and then we'll get into the puzzle piece of verse 6. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You may be seated. I'm going to pray and then we'll dive into Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself to us. I ask, Lord, that you would penetrate our hearts, that, Lord, that you would teach us about your grace this morning, that we would be able to make much of you with the light in our souls. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, brings us into this area of the Beatitudes. And it says this, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Now, as, as we read through the Beatitudes, we know that we have seen that those who are, are blessed, that, we, that those who, let me, let me get to my notes again because now I'm, I'm lost. Um, <laughs> sorry. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, verse 3, right? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are are those who actually encounter God and see themselves in in light of who God is. And what's the response? Blessed are those who mourn. Those who mourn, who see their lack, their sin before, and they mourn over their sin before a holy God. And that understanding, that, that, that being in the presence of God and that reaction of mourning over the sins before a holy God actually causes us to have a posture of meekness. That it's not about me. And there's a strength in that posture. And remember, in this part of the puzzle, Jesus is describing citizens of his kingdom. Not how to get into the kingdom, but saying this is what the kingdom, the citizens of the kingdom are like. And so then when we get into verse 6 here, and he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we start, we get, the, we get, there's a little bit of a shift in his explanation of these citizens. This is who you are. This is what you have seen. And this is what it causes you to be. Now here he begins to say, and this is what citizens do. Citizens of the kingdom hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. So here's where I want to go today. I want to look at this verse. I want to take three areas of discussion, if you will. The first is going to be what not to pursue. Do you see it? What not to pursue. What to pursue. And then how do we pursue it? How do we pursue the thing that we're supposed to pursue? So first of all, what not to pursue. If we just take a look at this verse, we would see something. You guys are like, duh, Jamie, but I'm going to point it out, right? What are we pursuing here? Satisfaction? No, we're pursuing something else. We're not supposed to pursue satisfaction. Oh, sweet. So if satisfaction is not that big a deal anyway, so I'm not going to pursue it. Is that what this verse is saying? No, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be truly satisfied. And so I put it this way. This is not, this is Jamie's way of portraying where I'm trying to go here. Little satisfaction versus big satisfaction. Okay? So satisfaction is good, but not all satisfaction is equal. And actually, there's a satisfaction that we actually pursue instead of God's righteousness. Right? There's a satisfaction that we pursue that just doesn't deliver. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we live in a world where we are more accustomed to pursuing lower cap satisfaction and not capital satisfaction. Blessed are those. They're satisfied. We offered this definition of being blessed. It's deep peace. It's an underlying state of satisfaction, an attitude of life, a state of being in harmony with life and at peace with God. Blessed are those who have this underlying state of satisfaction. But see, there's this little cap satisfaction that's of this world. This is the big difference right here. And then there's capital satisfaction that is of God. And we're used to little cap satisfaction of this world. Why do I say that? Oh, because I live in this world and I pursue little cap satisfaction. See, what happens when I pursue this world? When I pursue this world, what happens then is the things that I want become needs. The things that I want becomes needs. But here's the problem. I am stuck in that bad paradigm of seeing everything that I want as a need. I'm stuck there because I'm pursuing things of this world. 
Now, there's all sorts of things in this world that offer satisfaction, right? But they never keep their promise. They're fleeting. As soon as I get something, I want more. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He's talking about these promises that never keep, that are never kept. He says, the longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or when we first think of some foreign country or when we first take up some subject that excites us, these are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. See, we set our heart, we set our loves on something, and they're good things. That's what he says here, right? There's fine things, but they never actually deliver. These are the longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. And he goes on, he says, I'm not speaking of what would ordinarily be called unsuccessful marriages or trips and so on. He says this, he says, I'm speaking of even the best possible ones. There is something, though, that always we grasp at. And in the first moment of longing, it fades away in the reality. Oh, the spouse may be a great spouse. The scenery has been excellent. It's turned out to be a wonderful job, but... It has always evaded us. See, we set our hearts, our loves on things, and we say, I need that. I need it. And it never fully keeps its promise because our loves are disordered. Our loves are disordered. And I said, I said earlier that, just that you know, this is what we're, we're used to, disordered love, unfortunately. You see, if we, if we go, yeah, Jamie, I should, I should seek satisfaction. Satisfaction is a good thing, right? And I say, yes, it is a good thing. But if I look for satisfaction in this world, then I'm going to have all of these wants that I desire, these good desires. Bad desires, good desires are going to be things that I need. And then I'm going to be disappointed when I can't get them. So some of us would pursue satisfaction in this world and we will be perpetually exhausted because we blame the things in our life for not working, right? We blame a good spouse. We blame a good job. I'm still not happy. I have that job. It's, have you ever, it's, it's, it's interesting, just, you know, someone gets a new job. God so blessed me, right? This is of God. I can't believe that he gave me this job. And I'm always in my mind, often. Yeah, always. But maybe you should be off it. I'm thinking, yeah, wait, give me, let's talk in six months. Right? That new job is always from God. Six months later, like, why does God have me here, right? I mean, it, we're always chasing good things like that. And then what happens is we're never getting what we're chasing to the extent that we want it. So we try harder. We blame the job. We blame the wife. We blame the kids. We blame our circumstances then that way. And we're exhausted trying to achieve something that would never get achieved. And it brings about anxiety. Jesus is going to talk about in the Sermon on the Mount that very thing and how righteousness deals with that. Some of us are perpetually angry as we pursue it in this world. We're perpetually angry because we look at all the social forces and all the things out of our control and how they're oppressing us. And we say, I just can't do the right thing. I can't get anything done. So I'm just angry at everybody. I'm angry at the man who keeps me down. Some of us are perpetually just hating because we blame ourselves. We want to achieve certain amount of things. We can never achieve them. And finally we come to the realization that I'm just not good enough to achieve those things. And so I just just have a pity party because it's all my fault. And I experience depression, sadness, and some are just perpetually cynical. I, I think I'm, I'm 50, I turned 55 this week. Happy birthday to me. So I turned 55 this week. 55 is enough years in this world. To, and I'm a dreamer. Like I, I think dreams, they ain't coming. I'm cynical. 
I'm cynical. I just come to the conclusion that I just need to be, I just need to give up pursuit of my dreams, right? I need to give up pursuit of it, if you will. As if God didn't make me, make us to be satisfied, to bless us. And so I become like a stoic. You know, that's that's what the stoics, there's this, I was uh, reading about um, this idea from stoicism. And Cicero says this. He says, happiness in life is absolutely not possible. And he's talking about satisfaction. Happiness in life is absolutely not possible. Pleasure is possible, but you're never going to be happy. So you just have to kill that part of your heart that longs for it. Just kill it. And we go, yeah. Uh You know, because all those other things where I'm perpetually angry and I'm perpetually exhausted, they just make me weak, fragile. So I'm just going to protect that part of me. I'm not weak and fragile, and I'm just going to act as if. I'm just going to, it doesn't matter. I'm going to close up that part of my heart. Is that right, ladies and gentlemen? No, there's no good news in that. There's no gospel in that. See, the, the, the difference here is that I'm not to seek this satisfaction and these desires. I'm not, going, I'm not to seek it in this world. So the answer here is, is not to don't desire satisfaction. The answer is to desire true satisfaction that comes from God. Amen? You guys see the difference there? Okay, so I'm reading this and I'm going, I knew that already. I'm studying this, and I go, I got that. But then I look at my life, and I am functionally pursuing satisfaction from this world. And the first thing that this verse says is don't pursue that. Pursue satisfaction that comes from God. Okay, so so what is that? So now we're at our second point here in verse 6. So we know what not to pursue. We know what to pursue. We've kind of, kind of been nibbling around the edges of that. But what does he say pursue here? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What? Righteousness. We're, first, we're, we're supposed to. Good. Good Christian. Second row Christian. That's good for you. Righteousness. Oh, okay. I'm going to be a good Christian. I want to pursue righteousness. Let's go, kids. Right? What is it? What's righteousness that we pursue? Isn't that a good church word? Yeah. Isn't that a good biblical word? Right? We, we have these words, and then you go, it's a, you know, we, we got a friend, at, he's in the plumbing aisle at Home Depot, and he says, hey, what's righteousness? And we go, it's something you pursue. <laughs> I mean, that, that's where we're, we're at with this. So, so the reason that we had, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of teasing on that. I'm, I'm the same way. Righteousness is so important in all of Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, you hear you have this concept of righteousness. And from all of these different angles. And so we kind of know what it means, but it doesn't, it doesn't quickly come to our mouth, to our mind, on how to explain it. So here's what I would say. Okay? And you're going to go, Jamie... Did you do any study at all? I'm going, yeah, I did a lot of study. I'm just trying to boil it down here. Just work with me here. Now, the beauty of this verse 6 and this piece of the puzzle is that it's going to be a part of a whole section of this Sermon on the Mount, which is going to enlighten us with this righteousness over time here. Okay, But for now, consider this. Righteousness is being in harmony with God's design for life. Think about that. Now, I had this at first. It was righteousness is being in harmony with God's design for your life. And I said, that would, that's about you. No, we're just looking at in all of Scripture that God has a design for life. And when we are in harmony with that, we are righteous before him. You guys buying what I'm selling yet? So if we look at the Old Testament, here's where I'm coming from. If we look at the Old Testament, we start out in Genesis. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He, the drumbeat of Genesis is that God is putting things in order. And then all of this order mixing together in perfect 
order brings life. And when it brings life, the creator God of the universe declares it good. So from the very beginning, we have a design for how all things work together. And those things work together to bring about life. And that's what God calls good. Okay, so that doesn't, I know that's not like precise, but that's how the whole thing starts. And so then we see sin happens, comes into this world when man gets out of order, relational order with God. And then we see in scripture that God is, is now promised to put things back to the way that they're supposed to be, his perfect design. And he does it through a people. And he gives those people the law. The law, an expression of order. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8 says this. And what great nation is there, talking about Israel, that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Okay, so we've got God putting things right in order he now gives the, his people the law so that when they follow him, they would be righteous. Deuteronomy 6.25, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. All right. I'm going to seek righteousness. At this point, I'm going to say I'm going to do all his commandments. He sets them before me. He's the king. I'm going to do them. And then we see in Matthew how Jesus looks at all of this in the Old Testament. And he, he is questioned. He says, what's, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? And in Matthew 22, verse 37, he says this. He says to the lawyer, he says, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Oh, okay. So I just need to love the Lord. I, I just need, to, yeah, I just, I feel affection. That's, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Is that all I need to do? Well, Jesus ties it to what we've just been talking about. He says this, love the Lord with all your soul, with all your mind. This, verse 38, is the great and first commandment. Love is a response to God's declared order. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's what Jesus says. He says, he says you put it in order. You love is the proper order. It brings life, and that's what's good. And so we see then, continuing in the Old Testament, we see this, this righteousness. We see a righteous person. Proverbs 12, 20 says, 28, or I'm sorry, Proverbs eleven ten 10 says this, when it goes well with the righteous, this is Proverbs, when it goes well with the righteous, the one who's in order, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish there, or when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. What he's saying there, he says that the Sadiq, this righteous person, when he flourishes, it affects, it get, brings life to everybody. And everybody rejoices. Bruce Waltke says this about the Sadiq in Proverbs. He says the, the, the righteous is somebody who disadvantages himself for the advantage of others. That's somebody who is right. That's somebody who loves God with all their heart and their soul and their mind and their neighbor as themselves. They disadvantage themselves. Why? Because they are in right order in, ter in terms of their relationship with God. And then you heard Jim refer to this earlier, that even earlier in Matthew chapter 3, we see that Jesus, when he comes to be baptized, the reason he's coming to be baptized is to fulfill all righteousness. To do all of the things. To, put, to do them rightly. So righteousness then defined. Righteous, it literally means one who is right. Right? 
righteousness, the one who is right, it's also, we also see it as the opposite of sin, the polar opposite of sin. First John 1, 9, if you did our, our study with us this fall, you know this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin is the opposite of righteousness. Romans 1.29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil and covetousness and malice, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They're gossips. They're, they're all of these things that bring death, not life. That's sin. See, to commit sin is to go against God's design for our lives. Therefore, righteousness is being in harmony with God's design for life. We could go on and on. Do you see, you see how then that matters that we would love one another? Do you see how that would matter that we would come to God with a heart of worship because we love him? Proverbs 12, 28 says this, In the path of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. You can pursue little cap satisfaction in this world. It will bring anxiety and anger, and exhaustion, and cynicism, and death. Or you can pursue righteousness, God's good order that brings life. So then we come to this question. We go, okay, that sounds all right. It sounds like it might be a good way to go. Well, how, how do we pursue this righteousness, Right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Sounds like good news. How do we pursue it? We live in this world. How do we pursue righteousness? Well, this is going to be one of those duh moments. We hunger and we thirst for it. Does that surprise you? We hunger and we thirst for it. See, citizens of the kingdom of God have different hearts. They're new creatures. There's a divine transformation to bring citizens into the kingdom of God. It's bringing, in them, bringing them into the divine. And they have a new heart that guess what it does? Hungers and thirsts to be in harmony with God's design for life. That's just what they do. So then, we can put ourselves in the shoes of someone like Timothy, who hears from his mentor, Paul, in the letter, 2 Timothy. And Paul says this to Timothy. He said, be honorable, be righteous, and he says this, 2 Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's very beatitudic. Did you guys see that? We're going to come back to this passage and see why Paul is using this structure right here. But the first thing he tells Timothy in this passage is what? Flee. Flee youthful passions. You're like, I'm 75. I got no youthful passions. Yes, you do. Because you know what he says. He says, flee youthful passions. And then in the pursuit, we get to see what, the, what he's fleeing from. Not righteousness, right, but disorder and sin. Flee unbelief. Flee self-centeredness. Flee. Flee conflict. Unrest. Flee those things. Do you see those things in your life? And this go, well, that's just the way this life is. You can't. Because you hunger and you thirst for something more. For something different. So you need to flee those things. The radar needs to go up. And the second thing, we've already talked about this a couple weeks ago even, when we looked at Timothy later on in this same letter, Paul gives more instruction on how to pursue righteousness. You gotta train in it. 
right? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. God gave it to us so that when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we can get it. And so in his word, the reason that we're, we're going through Genesis, the reason that we study 1 John, the reason that we do this kind of preaching in Matthew is because God has given us this word. And this word is profitable. It's profitable for what? For teaching us what is right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. It's good for teaching and rebuke and correct and training in righteousness. When we go to Scripture with that expectation, what does it tell us? What does it tell us? Well, it tells us this, that we are not to seek little cap satisfaction. But it is good to seek all cap satisfaction from God. And the way that we do that is by pursuing, by hungering and thirsting for my righteousness. Correct? No. No. It corrects me on that kind of error. Because I'm just religious when I go, I just, okay, I'm just going to do it right. Okay, I got the law right in front of me. I know what to do. I just need to do it so that I can achieve my own righteousness. But it's not at all what Jesus has in mind. He says this in Matthew 5.20. So we're going to hit this. A little, so just, just a few verses later, he says, look, I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so the scribes and the Pharisees, they know the law. They've got a whole system and a whole culture to follow the law. And they do way better than me. And now Jesus says that if I'm part of his kingdom, then I hunger and I thirst for righteousness, but I have to be better than those guys. How come that doesn't crush me? Where's the good news in that? Well, he clarifies it. Next chapter, verse 33. And we're going to hit this and it's going to be, you're going to be like, oh, I got it. But Matthew 6, 33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things that you want, all of these things will be added to you. You shall be satisfied. We hunger and thirst for righteousness from the only one that can bring it is Jesus Christ. See, Scripture trains us in righteousness because it's filled with gospel truth that motivates us to do what is right for the right reason. That we would do it from a heart of love. And what gospel truth motivates us at the heart level? What gospel truth reorders our love and our needs and our wants? Well, it's Jesus. It's the truth about Jesus. You know, Genesis is about Jesus. Old Testament's all about Jesus. Revelation's all about Jesus. God saves sinners through King Jesus. And we know that this King Jesus, Paul tells us in a letter to the church at Corinth, second letter, he says, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says this, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, Jesus made him, I'm sorry, the Father, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So let me read that again since I messed it up. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. He was righteous. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God makes Jesus the righteous one sinful. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe into that good news? Do you believe into that truth? 
Do you look at Jesus, who's been made sin? Do you see him hanging on the cross? Do you see see the creator God of the universe stepping into this world, knowing our unrighteousness and sin and how out of order we are with a promise to say, I'm going to put it back in order and I'm going to do it through King Jesus, my son. And there he is on the cross. And the disciples have fallen asleep. And and we're, we're told that his own rejected him. And they persecuted him. And they hung him on a cross mocking him, rejecting him, denying him, betraying him, running away from him. And he took all of the circumstances of this world where I'm on the cross and I'm telling you what, I'm going, I'm going, I need you to stick with me. No, I want you to. He, he didn't pursue all of that to be fixed. What did he pursue? He pursued the love of the Father to obey him at that moment, and he dies on our behalf. The greatest act of love in the history of the universe. That's what scripture tells us. And when we believe that, that truth begins to reorder our loves in this life. And that is what we're looking for. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth. Lord, I ask that you would work it out in us. Lord, there's so many things to say, so many implications from a truth like this. And so, Lord, I ask that you would burn this truth into our soul and you would make us wise to live righteously. That, Lord, that we wouldn't pursue the things of this world. But that, Lord, that we would pursue your righteousness. And that we would delight in the fact that we don't need to achieve it. We simply need to hunger and thirst for it. So give us that appetite. In Jesus' name, amen.